I don't think you can separate Parliament from everything else that's happening in societies. If you have taken ownership of your country, just like your home or your own business, you're going to be interested in how it is run. You also need citizens, members of the public, who are really engaged with the political process. How the monies are being spent, where can we save, and, and, your, and your role in all of this. A lot of it is, is sort of a bit dull and it's a bit boring, and there's also a lot of politicians who are fighting um, and calling each other names, and a lot of the time that means citizens just go, do you know what, I don't want anything to do with that. It's, it's a more a psychological shift as a people, I believe, in taking ownership of country. But at the end of the day, wherever you live, the quality of your hospitals or your schools or your roads, everything is determined by these politicians. Governments don't spend government money, they spend people's money. It's taxation money. And it's important that the government be open and accountable uh, to, for, for every dollar they spend. If we want accountability, if we want transparency, then the chief accounting officers of each ministry must be prepared to come to Parliament, defend his or her position in public. It's not a private matter, this is a people's business. The difference between the developing countries, that is why we are developing, and the, and the underdeveloped world, if someone makes any mistakes or make any corruption, in the developing countries, they can get away with it. But if you look at the system in the, in the OECD countries, you know, uh, nobody can get away with anything. The heart of any democracy is the ability of the people to hold their government accountable. The soul of such a system is a machinery that allows citizens to see openly into the activities of their government and parliament rather than permitting these processes to be cloaked in secrecy. Parliaments and the governments are different in that uh, one is actually elected by the public and the other is elected by the uh, president and influence of the Prime Minister and stuff like that. The Parliament is inclusive of the government and the opposition. The government is just those who, who, who are elected into power by the people of Trinidad. I think government, uh, in essence, is uh, the people uh, who represent the party, uh, who has won the last election, uh, and are in fact the people who form the executive, uh, who, who run uh, in essence, the government. Government does things. It uh, comprises parties or party uh, that says it's going to do a range of things for people. They vote that party in and it uh, fulfills its mandate. It fulfills its purpose by doing all the things it promised to do. Whereas the parliament uh, are all members who are selected at a general election uh, and consists of the uh, government members and the opposition members. In the Senate you have three groups, people belonging to or supporting the ruling party, people belonging to the opposition, then you have independent senators, so people which have been selected because of their qualifications, because of their, um, their past work um, uh, record and, and uh, their anticipated contribution to the role uh, of the functioning of the party. to look at the chain that we have a parliament that makes the laws, approves the budget, we have an execution and then we have oversight mechanism. And surrounding that are the citizens. They're the ones to which ultimately all of those three key elements of the chain are accountable. Parliament should be the centre of national life. No citizen should feel that it's not his or her own uh, assembly and that they should have access to this assembly on many levels through uh, uh, civil society organisations, through uh, the, the role of the media, directly through their own MP by going and visiting and discussing. 
engagement through associations, uh, through lobby groups, uh, whenever members of the Parliament uh, have uh, roundtables or forums or go on radio shows or talk shows, it's really important for the public to be involved because you don't want your representatives to have uh, for their ear to be so far that they don't hear the voice of the people. If citizens feel the, uh, divorced from Parliament, then Parliament isn't doing its job well. If the Parliament can discharge its constitutional responsibility to oversee the effective collection of revenue uh, and then the effective spending of that revenue in a way that meets the expectations of constituents as well as the standards of good governance, then uh, you start to see just why good governance is so key to good human development. And that's why Parliament is so, uh, so very important because our Parliament really uh, is there, uh, one of its main functions, I believe, uh, is to hold uh, the government or the executive, uh, in essence, uh, to account. Uh Parliament, as opposed to government, the Parliament well, where you, is where you'll have uh, different sides of views, not only from the government, but from the opposition as well. Parliament, um, they are uh, there to make the, the laws and to make the policies, and then the government, they ensure that it is carried out. Well, really, uh, Parliament is mostly about making laws. It's about legislating and making laws. Government is about doing things. It's actually about uh, you know, building roads or running hospitals or running schools. Um, but of course, in parliamentary systems like the UK and like TNT, um, the, the two are, are, are sort of fuzzy. Um, in America, they're completely separate. You have a president who is the person who does things and then you, you have the, the uh, elected senators and representatives who, who make the law. So it's a, it's a clearer definition. Um, our system, uh, what usually happens is that people get elected as representatives but then they turn into government ministers as well and they kind of wear two hats because they're, they're ministers who are doing things and wearing that hat but they're also representative members of parliament who play a role in, in making laws. The government must accelerate its own program in the development of its hydrocarbon resources. More oil and more gas will mean a healthier economy and a stronger foundation for the future. I leave that for my colleagues to develop in the course of the budget debate. Good government ministers understand that they have a multiplicity of roles. They're, they're MPs serving their constituents after all, they're serving their, their party, they're serving the government, but they're also serving parliament. And uh, they have responsibilities uh, to parliament uh, to disclose, for example, uh, the basis of their policies in, in evidence when questioned reasonably by opposition members. At a time when we're experiencing the greatest threats from terrorism ever faced, our police office numbers and the resources have been cut. And he goes on to say, demands on the police have been increasing steadily as budgets are slashed, increasing stress on officers. Couple that with detrimental changes to their pay, terms, conditions and pensions. It's no wonder that morale in the police force is so poor that one in three are considering leaving the force. Will he be able to tell us whether or not this community policing and other police budgets are protected or not in next week's autumn statement? Minister! Let me tell you again, neighbourhood policing numbers have gone up by 3,800. In the capital city, we've seen a 500% increase in neighbourhood uh, policing. We've also, because we've cut bureaucracy, put the equivalent of an extra 2,000 police on the streets. But I'll tell the Leader of the Opposition something. As well as wanting resources, the police want the appropriate powers. And hasn't it come to something when the Leader of Her Majesty's Opposition Position, thinks that the police, when confronted by a Kalashnikov waving terrorist, isn't sure what the reaction should be. 
uh, so that uh, there's transparency there. So I think the, the problems arise uh, when uh, you've got uh, perhaps a minister who doesn't understand that very well or who cannot uh, easily cope with all of these, juggling all of these balls. I see that in uh, Trinidad and Tobago that there is a kind of tendency to say, uh, yes, we have elections, but the candidates for elections actually don't expect to be member of parliament, they expect to be member of the government. And I think that there, there is an, uh, an issue around um, uh, giving value to the function of the, the member of parliament. Well, it's an essential ingredient to any democracy to have a fully representative parliament which is active in scrutinising the executive and the government of the day and making sure that our laws that are passed are properly examined and the actions of the government are properly monitored and that's the role of an MP. Parliamentarians not only should be monitored alone because you can't just monitor someone and say okay they did X, Y and Z but they should be held accountable for what they do, how they spend, if the budget allocated a certain amount of money toward you at the end of that budget year you should be able to tell me how you used up that money, what you did with it, give me uh, information, forms, show me the work you did, I want to see it, I just, I do just want to hear from it. Democratic Parliament, uh, there would be a number of committees, roughly equating to uh, government departments, and the responsibility of each of these committees uh, would be to look at particular policy areas uh, that the departments are responsible for in some detail. Until a couple of years ago, you had only a couple of committees. You had the PAC, the PAC, and joint select committees. Now, new departmental committees on foreign affairs and energy, etc., have been created. So it moves more in the direction of trying to match specific policy areas in the committees to policy areas on the executive. In the UK there would be a defence, foreign affairs and so on committee and they would be working very hard, uh, having lots of meetings, asking government ministers and officials, travelling, making sure that the government was living up to its responsibilities. If the minister is saying that there is no money and has $3 billion, the private sector has money, private sector has land. Uh, is there any plan to incentivize this sector? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, member for Tabakit, this is something that uh, we will be looking at and certainly will be evaluating. You have the legislature and you have the committees. The legislature is, is like a theatre. It's going to be as adversarial as humanly possible. My job, frankly, as Prime Minister, is not to read a Servation opinion poll, but is to do the right thing to keep our country safe that is because it's televised, right? So members are, that's where they tend to perform the most. They tend to exacerbate or demonstrate a high level of um, adversariality, right? Especially for question period, question time, the opposition leader, you know, he has to look angry and, and demonstrate that there's a real problem. Order! Order! I now call the right honorable leader of the opposition, Ethel Compared to last year's budget, Growth last year, down. Growth this year, down. Growth next year, down. Growth in 2015, down. And all he offers is more of the same. When members take off that veneer, they can work very constructively in committee. And they do. They, there's many occasions where they can work more constructively in, in committee. Even if the committee is televised, it's still usually an opportunity to be a little bit less partisan than you were necessarily when you were sitting in the entire legislature. Um, where things tend to be more adversarial. But Trinidad Generation is not a state corporation. So how are they allowing you to owe them $665 million? Well, um, when we, um, in 2012, um, when we, November of 2012, I wrote my line ministry, I asked that they invoke what you call the government guarantee. Speaker, I beg to move that the following four members be appointed to serve with an equal number from the Senate on the Joint Select Committee on Energy Affairs. Trinidad and Tobago has a parliament which consists of two chambers, the House of Representatives and uh, the Senate. 
if there are parliamentarians coming together from one of these two chambers, then it is a select committee. If you have parliamentarians coming together from the two houses, from the two chambers, uh, with uh, members of the House and senators, then it is a joint select committee. Honourable members, the question is that the following four members be appointed to serve with an equal number from the Senate on the... And our role is to scrutinize not only government legislation, but actions of government and actions of agencies of government. We're essentially an oversight body in some cases, where we bring, uh, bring officials in from various departments and question them on their activities and their expenditures. Committees are the place where the real work has to happen and where also policies and proposals need to be examined based upon their merits and based upon the content and not necessarily based upon who is proposing it. I see in a number of uh, parliaments that government proposals are discussed in committees and in some, in some occasions uh, members of the opposition will support it because they say that's a very good proposal. In other occasions, uh, amendments or um, alternative proposals from the opposition will be accepted by the ruling MPs because they are good proposals. When I became chairman of the Public Accounts Committee in 1995, the government of the day had 52 seats in Parliament. The opposition had eight. And I was one of the eight members of the opposition. We actually promulgated a new law called the Public Bodies Management and Accountability Act. And the reason for that is that I unearthed a situation in 1999. It was commonly referred to as the public sector salary scandal where there was great unevenness across many public sector agencies in terms of how they allocated salaries to their chief senior executives. And because of the, 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 the stridency of the opposition of the day, the government was obliged to create a new law called the Public Bodies Management and Accountability Act. That's just an example, I think it's a good example of how an opposition Though small in numbers, must not allow itself to be intimidated into feeling that the, the majority is so overwhelming that why even bother? There should be someone put in place to monitor these MP and parliamentarians. One person. No, like, not just one, one person. person. Someone it should, should have, have like, audit. Like, it should have like, because one person, if I don't like you, I could be the one person and say, okay, you should resign. But if it's a group of people, they could come yes. up with, yeah. you know, right. a broader span and, 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 you know, weigh the pros and the cons, investigate the situation. In larger legislatures, uh, just about any piece of legislation that's introduced by government should be scrutinized by a parliamentary committee. So that's an opportunity to examine the bill, call witnesses, uh, and then make recommendations to Parliament. Uh, on the oversight side, you can conduct budgetary scrutiny, that is when the government introduces its budget into the House. You can conduct some type of scrutiny in Committee of the Whole. Uh, that's possible. So that would be sort of basically in the legislature, but with the Speaker not sitting in his chair, essentially. Honourable Member for Cipario. I thank you very much. I, I, I refer to um, the line items that have been transferred on page 72 from the judiciary to um, the Ministry of the Attorney General with respect to construction projects. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're not going to find that as an effective tool when it comes to public accounts committees. Um, that's something where you, you, it's almost impossible to have anything but a committee doing that kind of work. So committees are a way of uh, focusing members, you have a smaller group, you've got a chair who's supposed to keep things in line, uh, it's much more focused uh, and that works very well when it comes to oversight. The PSC and the PSC are probably the most important committees in the Parliament. They are also, I believe, the oldest in the, in the tradition of the functioning of the institution of Parliament. The role of the public accounts is to uh, uh, scrutinize the expenditures of government in an after-the-fact uh, way. It's also to uh, take the work and the recommendations of the provincial auditor and to provide 
uh, the meaningful change, uh, pushing government to uh, implement those recommendations. Could I ask the Auditor General to come in here? What is the regulation with respect to the engagement of services by a ministry? Are they allowed to just roll over a contract or should they put it out for them? You see, it all depends on the limit, the limit. You're, you're saying about rolling over the contract. For example, this one was three million. So suppose they're going over, they're going again and it's gonna be another three million. That is outside the scope, the authority, the financial authority of the um, permanent secretary. Um, understanding what they mean for uh, government and, and in, on the whole, ensuring that you are, are working towards um, uh, ensuring the best possible efficiency and economy and effectiveness of government uh, programs. The job of the PAC is really an auditing job because the auditor looks at the expenditure in a fiscal year, does the report at the end, presents it to us. So whatever comes up there is, is a retrospective view and corrective action naturally can still be taken despite the retrospective nature of it. But that's the nature of the PAC. The PAC over the last five or six years has um, managed to do something that's very difficult for uh, politicians and, and institutional structures and that is uh, to align its work with uh, political interests. So for example, uh, representatives of Amazon, Yahoo uh, and Google um, who have um, uh, tax mitigation schemes, who run tax mitigation schemes, which mean in effect that uh, they pay very little tax on the revenue they raise in the UK, were brought before PAC, named and shamed, and the result is that these, some of these organisations are going to pay 20%, 25% uh, tax uh, as from the next budget. PAC will sit twice a week. It has the resources of the National Audit Office, which has a body of 600 uh, uh, auditors and accountants. Uh, the, the National Audit Office is producing reports all the time. These reports are taken, a selection of these reports are taken by PAC and are turned into hearings. And the hearings are very lively, very tough, and people uh, completely hate going in front of PAC because they get, they get really roughed up. Common prerogatives of a, a good, a well functioning PAC, you want them to be able to summon documents, and when they summon documents, you want those documents to actually appear. You want the ability to have government officials turn up and testify when summoned. You want the ability to call witnesses and conduct hearings. And you want uh, the committee to be able to request audits uh, when it regards uh, something as being off in the accounts. Definitely there's a need for research support. And that's something that we find lacking generally in legislatures with functioning PDCs. So you need to have a researcher who's independent they're not part of the caucus, they don't have a political agenda, they work for the clerk's office or for the library, they're independent. And what are they doing? They're, they're providing brief briefing notes for the PAC prior to the hearing to be able to explain what's going to be discussed at the hearing in a very coherent way that members, let's say they haven't had time to read the report, they've rushed back from their parish, their constituency, they, they haven't had a chance to look at the report, the researcher has prepared a very brief uh, outline of what's what's covered in the report. Uh, knowing how to write the committee reports, having the researcher who's available to write the committee reports, um, conduct co benchmarking, comparative research, all those kinds of things. That's, that's one area that I think needs a lot of work. Um, I also think it's very important symbolically for, for committee meetings that committee members they sit randomly so you don't get blocks of party supporters and, and I think that again makes a difference. When committee recommendations are reported they should the chair should you know announce or should be a press conference or some kind of release in terms of you know, what's the outcome of their inquiry when they're doing that it's a very powerful symbol if perhaps if the committee chair is from one political party if another um, member of that committee from a different party is there and they're both portraying the results of that committee it's those type of almost symbolic um, ways of, 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 of doing scrutiny work that can make a big difference because I think the public get much greater confidence when they see you know, parliamentarians across the political divide coming together and talking about you know, the outcomes of, of, of scrutiny work.
when it comes to the Public Accounts Committee, that's just one of the mechanisms uh, for holding the government to account. There's a lot of other ways, right? There's also the pre-budgetary scrutiny, that is looking at the budget before it's been passed. For example, you know, looking at particular lines in the estimates and saying, you know, why are you asking for a 10% increase in your budget from last year? What do you need the money for? So being able to better understand what, what the purpose of the budget is before it's being passed, I would say that's definitely an important one. We felt that the, there was a need to be able to intervene in the budgetary process in real time as the budget is being expended. And that's what the work of the PAAC is, Administration and Appropriations. We are able to look at the accounts of any ministry, department or agency and, say, and bring them to the parliament and question them. How is the expenditure going? Are you on target? Are you achieving the targets that you have set out? Your quarterly targets, your half yearly targets, your monthly targets, how are you doing? But it's not just the financing is the way they go about it, the appropriation side of it. We have to also make sure that the various government agencies are following the correct procedure. While we do not speak to policy, we want to make sure the actual management of the expenditure and the expenditures itself is being adhered to. We are able to summon particular agencies to discuss those issues and to air them, you know, for public airing and to make recommendations to the Parliament for corrective action. Those recommendations, similar, we do it at the PAC and we are also making recommendations at the level of the PAAC. You should have the right to call back the Ministry or the government entity to actually say, well, you haven't agreed with this recommendation or you have agreed, uh, but to do some kind of follow-up as well. And this is where committees are often quite weak in that, firstly, it's sometimes a challenge to get responses from the government or ministries in time, but secondly, even, even if they do, now where's the follow-up? This actually is quite a serious issue. So I want to ask, are there any specific obstacles preventing you from presenting these audited statements? Th these accounts, I'm sorry. Thank you for that question. It is the challenges that have that is faced with respect to having these audited statements involve the verification of actual assets within the authority. And committees need to really introduce a mechanism where they revisit committee reports to actually see you now what's the outcomes of this process, you now what has scrutiny meant in practice. And those committees that have tried to experiment with, with uh, issues such as, for example, United Kingdom, the Public Accounts Committee, um, now looks at committee reports at random. So once a committee report has, has, has finished, they will go back and select some reports at random and, and revisit them and say, well, what's the result of this? And call back the entities in and say, now, did you do what you promised um, six months or one month ago? is part of saying to the public, yes, we have approved this expenditure, but we are also interested as a parliament to monitor to make sure that the money is spent correctly and most efficiently. So, it, 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 And of course, our PAAC is covered also by the, the media, so it gives the public a sense of assurance that yes, our parliament is monitoring um, how their tax dollars is being spent. Most of the time people are not interested uh, in politics because they're interested in their own lives. They want the politicians to do their job so they can do their job and uh, look after their families and, and so on and so forth. They don't have time to be interested. They're relying on other people to be interested. The other people that they are relying on are very often the fourth estate. They're relying on, on, on uh, civil society, they're relying on the media to tell them what they should think and what they should be worried about in terms of their politicians and their political structures. I would say that in the UK that works fairly well. The necessary part of democracy, the participation of the public. The further the public is away from the decision makers, the weaker your democracy is. And in Canada we, we encourage full, full participation and we receive it, especially on issues that are of uh, not just general importance but of vital importance to the public. Uh, they want to be involved and we welcome that. 
and through our select committees of parliament, we invite members of the public to come and make oral presentation and written submission on the bills which are before parliament. We bring witnesses to committees. Uh, we have, if, if we're studying legislation, so we'll have experts in the field, we'll have people that are strongly for the legislation, we'll invite people who are strongly against the legislation, we'll bring in academics, government officials, anyone who might, and, and citizens, anyone who might want to weigh in and influence the, the decision on how we look at the legislation or how we look at a report. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, my interest in the, the climate change debate was triggered in 1998. Public engagement is critical. And uh, of course you can't have everyone that lines up to become a witness, but we're very open in the breadth of experiences that we welcome into committees to, to become witnesses. Senators aren't supposed to be expert at, at the subject matter, so we require experts in the subject matter, and that will be the witnesses. The media should also feel that responsibility to the citizens of of Trinidad and Tobago to, okay, if, if they know something is going on in the parliament or in the government, something that is not transparent, they should feel responsible enough to want to come and bring it forth to the citizens. Bank of Jamaica Governor Brian Winter continues to push financial institutions to cut interest rates. Mr. Winter made the case last week at his quarterly press briefing and continued to do so when he faced Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee PAAC today. I think beyond the, the, the courage of the opposition right, and the commitment of the government to transparency is the role, I believe, of the press in also helping uh, to, to shape the effectiveness of the Public Accounts Committee. And, and that role includes not just what they carry on primetime news, but actually it has evolved now where they actually carry the sessions live on the public broadcasting station. So we believe that this kind of transparency has actually helped uh, in the process of accountability. Uh, a lot of agencies and permanent secretaries, they make sure they are diligent about responding to the queries of the Auditor General because guess what? They don't want to appear before the committee <laughs> and to be scrutinized <laughs> in, the, in the public glare. It's a daunting experience appearing before the PAC, especially if you are the one in charge because everything that a staff member does down the line that is incorrect you have to answer and when you answer you answer to the parliamentarians and you have to make sure that you answer correctly the thing to do though is to answer or fix before the PAC and if you fix properly and if you answer properly and if you satisfy the auditors then you don't have you don't have to appear but there are times when you have to appear nonetheless and that is when it gets very daunting. A lot of the queries that the Auditor General has are being cleared up before the PAC gets to it because they don't want to appear before the PAC. PAC. So it's a kind of a, there's a fear. <laughs> but, but sorry, we are humans, we smile a lot when, <laughs> when we, we're interviewing our, our, our government servants. We, we are not really hostile. We just want the information, that's all. Are you saying it has taken almost five years to establish the physical assets of WASA? Your buildings, your wells, your pumps, five years? I think that the verification exercise, it deals with respect to the several assets that, are, that the authority owns. There's quite a bit of, of uh, unevenness in how the different territories practice it. In fact, in some of the jurisdictions, they have a public accounts committee. They have a supreme auditor, like an aud auditor general, but that's about it. They've actually, they've virtually admitted that in some of these jurisdictions, the public accounts committee is virtually non-existent. It doesn't function. 
is not working. You have a public enterprise committee in Trinidad. That committee should be, could be perhaps more proactive to review all the financial statement of your $20 billion investment. And they need to go beyond looking at the financial statement. They are where the citizens will be interested. You invested $20, $25 billion. Citizens will be really interested to look at what is the outcome of those $20, $25 billion every year. So prepare a summary by the Ministry of Finance, the owner of these public enterprises, give it to the parliament, have some deliberations on those, some of the issues, and bring all the misuses of public funds, if any, done in any public enterprises. Then everybody will be interested in front of your television channel to look at what is happening in those reports, you know? Parliamentary scrutiny is where you critique the members, well, parliamentarians, uh, where you don't follow their opinions, where you actually ask questions, analyze their opinions, and think about what they said. Basically, like a critique, uh, observation of the parliament and the various things that go into Statements the parliament. That the yeah. members make. The purpose of the scrutiny is to get um, views from everyone, to see that everything is well thought out, to make a well thought out informed decision. So one person alone would not be able, if one person was to um, run an idea through, there could be flaws and holes in there and I think the purpose of the scrutiny is to get everyone else's views to tighten up those holes and to um, ensure like a well thought out decision is made. Often, uh, particularly in developing countries, there's weak capacity uh, to uh, not only conduct scrutiny at the parliamentary level, but at the executive level to frame public accounts in an appropriate, comprehensible and constitutionally appropriate way. When we talk about legislative oversight, we need to think about legislative and oversight not only in terms of uh, fostering accountability, but accountability of who? And I think it, it, we need to think about it in terms of each of those elements of the chain has to be accountable. Often governments won't submit a budget in time, uh, they won't provide detailed policy papers. Uh, the uh, sync up between the election cycle and the budget cycle in relevant years when there is an election is sometimes uh, completely inappropriate as far as constitutional expectations for scrutiny are concerned. Best practice in, in some uh, really um, well-functioning democracies requires a three-month period to review the budget. And three months period means that there is three months from the time that the budget is introduced in Parliament until the final vote. During this period, uh, individual MPs can study the budget, can ask questions, gather additional information, committees can gather and, and, uh, and, and uh, give their opinion. Uh, that is not the case in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, so far, the review of the budget um, is done in a much shorter period. There's often uh, a problem with uh, the government having a preponderance of members in the legislature, uh, ministers serving on a public accounts committee and there, therefore, being uh, therefore having difficulty in uh, conducting any sort of objective scrutiny. Is it that the Ministry of Finance is just comfortable with them? So it did not decide to do any value for money audit or performance audit or bother to invite tenders to see if you could get a more competitive price. You're just happy with them and you just the, go with the flow. The, the contract just kept, kept go, going But on. why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. No, um, AG. AG, AG, AG. No, no, but AG. I want to be asked that answer. But don't because answer. I know because there's some things I understand. The, <laughs> the, I understand the constraints of the public officer. And I think we need to be fair to them. If I'm the Prime Minister, or if I'm the Speaker, I'll not allow any of my ministers to be in any of the oversight committees. That's not wrong, but that's not good practice. A minister can't hold a minister to account. If I'm the Minister of Education, uh, and you're trying to hold the Minister of Finance to account, this is my buddy in Cabinet. Uh, so what are you talking about here? So keep him out. You know, keep those ministers out, uh, allow uh, the backbenchers uh, to, uh, to have the clear look 
if a committee is concerned about an issue or wants to discuss about a particular department's policies, we can bring the minister to the committee and grill them, scrutinise them, question them, uh, ask them all sorts of questions and put them on the spot. And that's the whole point of them, that they're there to keep a check and a balance on what governments are doing and what particularly what ministers are doing and how they're performing. So it's all about safeguarding uh, resources, safeguarding the public, working directly with the uh, uh, independent uh, auditor uh, uh, to do so, and then also uh, acting uh, independently as a, a public accounts to uh, uh, make sure that uh, you're doing all you can to uh, provide the scrutiny and oversight and make recommendations that are in the public's interest. The group of persons who are chosen to hold people accountable for their actions shouldn't just be for the government or for the opposition. They should be an independent set of people with a broad span of thinking. I, I would like it to be from both sides because you have a balance. Some people could be from one side, some could be from the other, and mm -hmm. a few people independent. Public Accounts Committee is usually uh, chaired by a member of the opposition, uh, but all parties are represented on these uh, committees. My select committee, for instance, which is the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, consists of 11 people. So you have six government uh, members and five opposition. In a strong parliament, the committees see themselves as quite independent and able to criticise government and even MPs that are members of the uh, party government made up from uh, are usually uh, able to criticise. But we're all very independently minded and we don't get told what to do or told what to say. We can question the government and express our own opinions and we do and that is the way of pinning ministers down and you know we shouldn't be afraid of upsetting or even embarrassing ministers on our own side. You can't be a minister or a shadow minister and be on a select committee. So at the end of the day, it is for backbenchers to scrutinise what the ministers are doing. So it has to be backbenchers. Certainly in the UK context, it would never happen. You would never get a minister as a member of select committee. And I think there are good reasons why that would be the case, because they're the people we're supposed to be scrutinising. So ministers are not members of committees at all because they have to answer to Parliament. You should take evidence from them. I think they should come before the committee, you should ask them questions, but I would find it difficult to accept them as a member. Well, one of the big, big challenges for, for members of parliament, they're always generally very good orators. So when it comes to um, being an effective member of a scrutiny committee, what you need to be doing is asking questions. So that's the key, is, is to be able to have a line of questioning and to start very, with a very specific question. The more broad the statement, the more broad an answer you're going to get and the more wiggle room you're going to leave for people. So if you give a three minute speech, then you've, you've just left all kinds of room for the, the accounting officer or permanent secretary to answer the question, in a, in, in, to choo, pick and choose the way they're going to answer the question. The more focused the question, the more focused the answer. We don't uh, elect experts, we elect generalists. And therefore what we have to do is find ways to equip them uh, with the right expertise. So in some parliaments you have research units, departments, in other parliaments this is called a scrutiny, scrutiny unit, but in, in all cases this is the same uh, function where uh, specialized staff um, is actually set aside to research specific areas, to scrutinize policies and to make uh, proposals from a very a small one or two pages until more extensive studies which can go up to 100 pages um, uh, in relation to specific areas. Yeah. One of the things about the Public Accounts Committee that I've always felt uh, is that it kind of deals with things after they have happened, the cart, the horses out running around uh, at 100 miles an hour and now you were trying to deal with, uh, with these issues and and going back. And the, the challenges I've seen in, in some of the Caribbean countries would be much different from what I've seen in terms of PACs in other developing countries. The, the main problem is the nature of the reports. 
Um, that, that is the kind of high level information that parliamentarians need to know and can act on. Often there's problems with authority. Uh, the provisions of the standing orders or other documentation that govern uh, the Public Accounts Committee's terms of reference may be out of date. One of the misconceptions uh, sometimes around oversight is that um, uh, is the saying that um, you know the opposition complains but the ruling party rules. I think that is uh, not correct. Oversight is a responsibility for the whole Parliament. All members of Parliament from the opposition independent senators as well as MPs from the, the ruling party, those MPs which are really MPs, they have a responsibility for oversight. Like if you commit treason against your country by stealing from the treasury, you should be able to be prosecuted and go to jail of Hold me, hold the person accountable some sort of way, not just tell like them, okay, sign a, sign a paper and tell me you resign. We can't give these people all this power and then not hold anybody accountable. Then, I mean, they're in charge of themselves. You know, when you give anyone too much power, you know what happens, right? What I believe is that with the responsibility now, it would be that in Parliament, the way they conduct themselves, the views they represent should be those of the people. Personally, I believe more clarification should be given in the public eyes. Not every citizen will understand the, the parliamentary language then. They want, they want things at their level. How do we go beyond just looking at the reports? There needs to be more of a response. Having legislative oversight which reviews audit reports or investigative reports or performance assessments, it needs to go beyond to say, well, did something happen as a result of us looking at that report? So this is the key. Is there follow-up? A public accounts committee and an auditor general and any other system that you have for oversight can only work if you have the political will and the commitment to transparency. Transparent promotes accountability because you could have the most perfect system, it could be so well executed, lovely budget, but if nobody knows about it, then nobody's accountable for did it deliver what it was intended to do. Transparency is crucial. The public demand that committees um, need to be not just open and, and televised, um, but committees themselves need to be transparent in terms of the way that they've done business. Uh, I like the practice that's taken place in some parliaments where they produce um, legacy reports at the end of a parliament. The committee should look back and see, well, what have we actually achieved as a, 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 as a committee? And they should report to that. They should report to the people in terms of, we as your representatives, we have done this over the last four or five years. We've achieved this. These are the issues we've uncovered. Um, this is a, you know, a problem, a cross-cutting issue that, that keeps cropping up. And it's not just important in terms of transparency, transparency to the public, it's also important for any successor committee that's, that starts up that they can actually look back so there's greater coordination between different parliaments. And secondly, it needs to be timely. Quite often we see time, the reports being less than, than timely. That reduces accountability. It's, it's certainly, uh, it certainly does not promote good governance and effective management. We must find a way to involve our, the average man. And I believe one of the ways to do that is to engage our young people. And maybe in, in the, in the pre-budget um, preparation, we throw these things out and have them as young people to debate it. Um, but part of it is how do we simplify that so the average man can understand. Because you, you have all these highfalutin terminologies and figures and and people can't relate to it. You have to now break it down in simple terms how it affects their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And then, if you want to strengthen parliamentary oversight, one aspect I want to bring, this is political a little bit, the confrontational politics is not serving the interest of the people. So when a party wins the election, it is the responsibility of the winning party how to bring forward the other oppositions together, work as a team. Some of the challenges that government has is with the people. 
So when the people are more involved, then I believe that they can be a part of the solution. I mean, in Jamaica now, we're, we're, we're talking about growth. It's not just, when we speak about growth in an economy, it can't be just the big businesses doing well or doing better. It is also about the small businesses. It is where that little man, that little woman, see themselves as part of that growth. First of all, I think it would be important that, um, of course, uh, when the agenda of the committees are made public and available on the, on the website, that also civil society at regular intervals is invited to contribute. Uh, I see, I know that in a number of countries, each committee, they have a roster of civil society experts, stakeholders, relevant persons, which can be called upon. Um, called upon to testify in front of the committee on a specific issue, but also to be as a source of expertise. And so it is, whatever we're doing in terms of public expenditure, um, saving money, spending more wisely, the people must feel that it is their business, because in fact, it is their money that the government is spending. I think it's completely unrealistic for people to be intensively following, for all people to be intensively following what, what is happening and uh, all the time, and in a sense to be governing the country from their kitchens. Uh, that's not what's required. What's required is some thought about uh, their, uh, who they're going to vote for, the quality of their representative, and to take notice when things are beginning to go badly wrong, to be sensitive and, and objective uh, when uh, they read that something is, 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 is not right. Citizens try to see what is the substance of whole deliberations. Unless it is very substantive, they will not be interested. I always advise the Auditor General, it is good that you are submitting thousands of pages audit report to the Parliament, but give me 50 pages. Ten major cases, those should be discussed under camera, and decisions will be taken, and decisions will be implemented immediately, and people will know who are the people penalized for misusing 5 million, 10 million, or 5 billion. My feeling is that uh, going forward, as Trinidad is one of the uh, leader of the economic development in the Caribbean, I think uh, as a government, both uh, money and also the opposition should look at what are the good practices around the world. You, know? you look at what you were doing, then you look around what are the good practices, can you adapt it, learn from them and develop the society and that is leadership. We advise them to go through the standing orders as well as the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, right, as their new coming MPs. I believe that will do them very well. I would say represent the persons who elected you because I had the opportunity to vote this year. The best advice I could give them would be to make sure and learn the rules, the regulations, make sure they know how to uh, scrutinize properly without offending anyone. Do not just um, take it for granted and, and make it into a big make things into a big scandals and just work for your country. Your country put put you there for a reason. So work for them. When new members come into Parliament, uh, they 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 usually feel overawed and underpowered. Um, for, for uh, assistance and guidance on the job, they go first to the procedural staff of Parliament and the relationship between uh, members and the staff is, can, is a very close one. The staff run the organisation and members are, are, are always um, open to discussions with staff, they come to staff for advice, staff are very uh, open to giving that advice and that is a big source. But at the, uh, the same time, they've got their uh, designated party whip, uh, and that party whip will guide them in the way of putting down questions, uh, the best way of getting answers out of the government, and the way to conduct themselves, what a closure motion is, and all the rest of it. So they do have these, these, these two. In terms of new MPs, I think, in a way, I don't have to give them advice, because most of them, when they come in instinctively, 
realise that actually select committee work is really interesting that it's much more interesting quite often than sitting in the, in the main chamber where everybody's just, you know, playing the Punch and Judy sort of politics. The key thing is to be involved with as many committees as possible because as a backbencher who's not in the executive but on the legislatory side, it certainly gives you an opportunity to understand governance and how it functions. My advice would be to not only to get involved but to do a lot of preparation. They need to firstly learn the rules. They need to learn and understand the standing orders. Um, if they don't understand the standing orders, they should have the confidence to, to consult with the clerks and to get them explained. Because what, what you often see is uh, in, 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 in Parliament is members saying, oh, they can't do this, or they, oh, they can't do that. Well, in actual fact, that they can, they just don't know how to do it. And so it's very important, very much the stage when their first you know, weeks in, in Parliament that they have a proper induction programme, they spend time with the clerks and they go through the, the rules and the expectations uh, of, of, uh, of being a parliamentarian. And as part of that process as well, I think they need to be you know, told of the importance of, of scrutiny, the importance of, 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 of committee work. So you get people from all walks of life coming into the legislatures. Teachers, doctors, uh, social workers, people who don't necessarily have expertise in financial scrutiny. Understandably, not everybody in life is an accountant, right? So it's very important to be able to provide some training to members of parliament and members of legislative assemblies regarding issues like how do you scrutinize the budget? How do you look at um, a financial statement and understand it? Um, before the budget is, when the budget is introduced in the legislature, how do you ask questions about the budget? When you have the minister or the deputy minister of a particular department there, uh, what documents should you be using to get ready for that uh, hearing? All those kinds of questions are, are very, very important. Uh, similarly, after the budget has been expended and you've got the Auditor General's report that's come out, right? Um, and you, you've got uh, the deputy minister of the particular department. What kind of questions should you be asking the deputy minister? How do you hold the government to account? My advice to anybody coming in is try and keep the politics out of it. Try and keep it issue-based and actually you'll enjoy it more as a member but you'll be way more effective in terms of the service that you provide um, to, to your citizens and, and actually to government because Sometimes governments do need to be told what isn't working, even if they don't want to hear it.